Through a 20-year journey and track record in leading several successful healthcare ventures, our next guest came to recognize the significant need to affect exponential change in advanced illness management. During this episode, Jeremy Powell, CEO of Acclivity Health Solutions, joins us to discuss how his business exits with the same leadership team, position them to notice the gaps in advanced illness management, and why Acclivity Health Solutions has become an industry leader. Additionally, Jeremy shares where he sees palliative care heading into the future and how you and your community can get involved with the critically needed efforts of his organization and mission. Join us to learn from Jeremy, a true servant leader, as we continue to work together to move the health of our nation forward. Let's go. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to our podcast. I'm honored to be able to spend time with you today. Hi, Mike. Same here. Well, given your passion to affect exponential change in end-of-life care, I'm incredibly excited and honored to be having this conversation with you today. But before we jump into your very important journey and work, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passion to Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, please visit the bottom of the episode notes to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Clubhouse in order to further the conversations occurring on this podcast. All right, Jeremy, it's almost time for our community to learn why you and the Acclivity Health team continually strive to innovate and deliver technologies that providers need to ensure patients with advanced illness receive the right care at the right time in the right setting, all while honoring the patient's dignity, goals, and values. But first, We're going to get to know you personally. I'm going to randomly select an icebreaker question. Jeremy, we're talking food, my friend. Favorite meal and why? Honestly, it's probably about anything at Salt, which is a restaurant in Amelia Island at the Ritz. It's a Michelin restaurant. The menu changes frequently, but the ambiance of that location, the service that's impeccable, the Atlantic Ocean being outside of every window, and then it's with my family. As an entrepreneur, you often leave to go and chase what's going to be an impactful journey for the rest of the world that you happen to serve. So that might be the very best meal that I get to have. Now, is this the restaurant? Is there a certain few meals that you always go back to time and again, or is there just that one? So inside of that restaurant, there is a steak dish. I'm a sweet and spicy kind of guy growing up in the South. I knew I liked you. Yes. So there is a almost teriyaki style steak that's divine. You cook it on heated rocks at the table, like you cook your own steak to the temperature. So you can't, you can't get it wrong and it's delicious. And so we'll do that meal. There's a chef's table you can sit at. So it's really, it's as much an experience and I'm a foodie. So the food is impeccable, but it's also as, as much an experience as it is an actual meal. Well, I love it. I'm a foodie as well. And I love the experience. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I can't wait to get back out on the road. So I don't have to keep eating at the same restaurants or ordering at my house during this pandemic, the same stuff over and over again. Can't wait to get back on the road, enjoy some food. Actually, we just had Dr. Stefan Obini on a couple episodes ago. He's heading up Doc SF, big conference in San Francisco. And he was talking about being from Italy, having food from Italy. I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to get back on a plane to go and have some food in another country. Sure. Yeah, I understand. I think the impact of community certainly has been tethered to this pandemic and the new normals that have been created. So certainly food, but also the fellowship of being outside of the small group that you have, in our case, kept really tight constraints on who we're seeing and what we're doing. So like you, the food will be a big celebration, but so will all the other life events that we're missing, the graduations, the marriages, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Right there with you, Jeremy. Well, thank you for sharing for your love of food and where you like to eat and the experience around it. And I'm looking forward to discussing your journey and mission with Acclivity Health Solutions after we get back from thanking our community champion sponsor. With rising burnout, malpractice, digital, and personal risks, clinicians face greater than a million dollar liability. And in today's climate, busy frontline healthcare workers don't have the capacity to attend to these risky blind spots. 
but the Adapt Track team is bringing hope and solutions to the healthcare industry. Adapt Track's mission is to help clinicians and their practice teams work and live better. Adapt Track's 30 second nudges unlock category one continuing medical education credits along with insurance savings while meeting the busy clinician where they are. On Clubhouse, during weekend nature walks, through all of helps from this podcast and over 3,000 additional work-life moments. To learn more about Adapt Track and how you can engage in active learning that drives a 5X plus ROI, a 30X time savings, and an experience clinicians will love, head over to adapttrack.com or visit the top of the episode notes and click on their link. All right, we are back with Jeremy Powell, CEO of Acclivity Health Solutions. Jeremy, we have a lot to discuss today. You've been at it now, 20-year track record, multi-exits. You've been leading some of healthcare's most successful ventures during your journey in healthcare. And today, we're really going to focus in on Acclivity Health Solutions and what you guys have been doing there. Several years ago, you and your team, you guys saw a need for a radically different approach to delivering care in the later stages of life. And from that and from personal and professional experiences, you and the team had Acclivity Health Solutions come to be. Give us a little bit more of that journey. Let's dive into the details a bit. Where were those experiences? Where were those aha moments? Then we'll talk a little bit about today, what you guys are working on in this very fast and dynamic changing world that is healthcare, especially further exacerbated and compounded with the pandemic. And then of course, where you see things heading in this space? Where is the industry going? What do we need to be thinking about? What should we be mindful of? But for now, Give us a little bit of that backstory, Jeremy. How did this all begin? What were some of those aha moments? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the luck I've had and being a part of those journeys that were so successful, it really put me in position to be right in the middle of the action, inclusive of North American commercial healthcare with hospital systems and payers, but internationally inside of, say, Canada's Ministry of Health or the NHS over in England and Scotland. And I think really the beginnings of acclivity happen when you see that the other systems work around the entirety of a person, not just the disease state of a patient. And that began sort of being seeds that we kept coming back to and trying to cultivate. It wasn't until we actually walked the floor of HIMSS, the Health Information Management System Society Showcase, which is so big now, it can only be in Las Vegas or Orlando. It's enormous. Yeah, it's like seeing the ocean for the first time. And so we <laughs> walked the floor and we recognized everybody was on to population health, but nobody was doing things to activate how care could be improved. It was, oh, here's a patient that needs something, but nothing that could tie that need into action. And so we married these two ideas. Wait, you can do it really well, like the NHS does, where the whole person's looked at and managed well. And you can do it with this data capability. And if you married those two things together and you focused on a population that gets no focus, this end of life care doesn't get any technical or navigation or clinical focus until the hospice event occurs. If you did that well, we could really change the complexion of healthcare. And so that was the origin story. I'll tell you a personal event happened on top of it, which is one of my closest friends, her dad got a metastatic pancreatic diagnosis, and she's a palliative fellow clinician out of Vanderbilt working in the space. And we saw that, wait, we could predict that that was going to happen. And then we could deliver what she delivered, which was really the best level of care for her dad as a doctor, right? So being able to be a part of that journey, understanding what was going to happen, guiding him through it, that became the aha on top of those other early learnings that became the business that is Acclivity. And we'll ask about the business in just a moment. I know you've given the elevator pitch many times over. I'm going to ask for it for just a moment, mm -hmm. share with the community what exactly you guys are going after. You teed it up a bit. But I have to ask you, Jeremy, we have so many entrepreneurs, so many startup founders that are tuning in. They want to be you one day, right? Multiple exits, been there, done that, bought several t-shirts along the way. Sure. How important is an aside, just because I'm curious, I know the answer for me personally, but I want to hear it from you as well. How important is the team? How important is it with the folks that you've been going into business with to make sure you have rock solid team that investors can invest in or building what is a vision that you have, how important are those team members? I don't think there's anything that's more important. A close second, though, might be the energy to keep getting up every day when a lot of people are telling you it'll never happen. But if you have a team like we do that have done most of these exits together going back two decades, you just know each other in every kind of meeting what people are going to give. We used to talk about juice 
in some of our previous businesses with other leadership. And juice is what happens when you squeeze an orange. Juice comes out. And is it really positive and sweet like an orange juice is? Or is it bitter and tough to take? And always this team delivers the most incredible juice when they're put under pressure. And so when you know that about a team, there's this trust, this recognition that we're all rowing towards the same horizon. Nobody in the boat is dramatic or creates drama. And that's game changing. There are parts of our business I never have to inspect or wonder about because this team is just we're a bit like family. We know what's going to happen under certain situations. Well, you know, as well as I do, you can start with one vision for the business that you have at hand and you can have multiple pivots, multiple uh, different directions of taking it. For instance, I mentioned to you before we started recording, I'm fortunate to be working at Olive. Sean, our CEO, he'll even tell you it was on the 28th pivot that turned Olive into the unicorn that she is today, right? 28 right. times, right? Sure. So to be able to have a team that you can trust, that you can move forward in unison, and make those decisions and trust one another along the way, incredibly important. Yeah, I bet Sean has a number of times when he recognized we were headed in the right direction, but there was one more thing that needed to be added. On our side, some of the new blood that's come in as new team members brought those other incremental intangibles to the old guard, so to speak, and have made us even more open to what's the possibility for acclivity. It is a people business that we're in. And inside of our business, I would bet on these people more than any other, just because of what we've been able to do in the short four years we've been at it. We're in 40 states, 4 million patients on our system. And that's truly about this team and not about me. I just happen to be the face on today's call. But if you were to talk to any of our team, you'd have the same passion and outcome. Well, let's talk about the team that is building Acclivity Health Solutions. You guys have been at it now for almost four years. You mentioned millions of lives. Unbelievable. Jeremy, let me ask, a number of years ago, when you had the vision, was the industry ready for it? Were you building and getting ready for what the industry was inevitably going to be? Kind of build where, as Wayne Gretzky always says, skate where the puck is going to be. How were the market dynamics? What was it like when you were first starting to turn on acclivity? Was it being well-recognized? Were people accepting it? Give us a little bit more of that journey when you first founded it. Yeah, when we first got started, we had a really great idea and the promise was there. But I'll be honest, had we started a couple of years earlier, it would have been much harder. If you remember, the Affordable Care Act was passed, which the press typically calls Obamacare. There was a lot of rhetoric around death panels and rationing of care. Like We couldn't have started acclivity in that era. But what the Affordable Care Act actually did was create the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And we didn't know this. So some of this is luck and timing and we think we're smart people. We've got a lot of good team around the table, but it is... You always got to have a little bit of that. Yes, but it is also very lucky that what we were building towards, there have been so many legislative and policy changes that now make it easy to accomplish. The idea was always the right idea, right? So we were skating to where the puck was going, but we had this huge acceleration number of events that were happening with CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. We have the plans now understanding that this is a huge thing they have to tackle. We have a silver tsunami, so 10,000 persons a day come into Medicare. So all of those things with the baby boomers aging and all of those other things I mentioned really have set us up to have really this impact story that we wouldn't have had eight years ago or maybe even eight years from now. So right time, right place, right people. Wow. Well, let's start talking about that impact story, Jeremy. You teed me up. Give us the pitch. What is Acclivity Health Solutions? And then, like I said, we'll talk a little bit because things are changing just so fast in front of us, especially as we think about what the pandemic has done to the industry. But for now, what's the elevator pitch? Yeah. 5% of Medicare population dies every year, and they are the most fragmented part of the healthcare journey. If you think about healthcare as a subway system, they're the last stop on the subway. You would think we would have a combined record of all of their events leading up to that, but almost never does that happen. And so the sickest, most fragmented, most chronically complex patients don't get well served. 80% of people want to die at home, 65% die in a hospital, and their families have to make really tough decisions. That is a bad outcome for everyone. And so what our business does is it starts aggregating data from all the places that its data is fluid. And we analyze that data to help patients and their families make really good decisions such that their wishes about what they want to have happen to tie off spiritually, emotionally, familially, physically with their end journey is done well on their behalf. And as a company, we tie together the hospice and palliative organizations with the persons who have aligned incentives, typically health plans, the provider services organizations that deliver primary care or oncology care. Those are kinds of the groups that marry themselves on our system and payers to the 
palliative and hospice service providers. And magic happens. Now patients and their families have answers because there is no incentive for a hospice to do escalation of care. Their incentive is to deliver the highest quality care for the family. And that's game changing. And so what does that look like in regards to the end experience for those patients, for those families, right? We need to always keep that in mind as well. What does that experience look like for them? So there's a survey measure that asks the family after the death, do you wish you had found hospice sooner? Almost 100% of the time, the answer to that question is yes. So what it gives to the family is a Sherpa, a team of them, actually. So you have social worker component, a nursing component, a physician component. You have behavioral health services. You have respite care. So if the family is burdened by the care of their loved one to such an extent that they just need five days of relief, hospice will take them into an inpatient unit and care for them while that person who's typically the oldest daughter relaxes, goes to weddings, goes to her son's graduation. So it is truly this haven in healthcare that's not used well. Most people think of hospice as where I go to die, but it's really where you can go to get the care that should have been provided all along. It is truly care, a capital C care, instead of more intrusive behaviors like another surgical intervention or another set of chemotherapy. It is truly, what do you want uh, patient and family and how do we help achieve that using all of these different Sherpas that have aligned to deliver that kind of outcome? It hasn't been received on the provider side as well. You know, as well as I do, the infrastructure in healthcare, right? We're very focused at all of to turn the internet of healthcare on, right? That's Sean's vision, our CEO at all of, and you know this, you've lived it, Jeremy, so many disconnected silos, so many things not talking to one another. What's the experience for the other stakeholders in this journey that they are having with Acclivity Health? So it's a weird position to have to think about the financial model of healthcare and the clinical model. But in every instance, all of these providers are in and of themselves part of the business of healthcare. And so the magic aligns when an organization like us allows all constituents that serve the patient and the family to recognize there is no loser in this clinically. There are no clinical outcomes that are bad. There are no financial outcomes that are bad. But if you marry them to one another in what we call connected communities, the value of that community is a network of providers with aligned incentives. And the clinical outcomes are extrapolating much better financial returns than what the standard of care does. And I'll give you a real world example. Nationally in the United States, $32,000 is spent on average in the last 30 days of life. Hospice costs $5,000. If you only did that part, you would save $27,000 per death. And oh, by the way, everybody that gets to serve that patient are now aligned to do the right thing for the patient. Nobody's looking to escalate more care. They're looking to do the spiritual tying off, the familial tying off, the emotional tying off that a last journey and through the last quarter of life actually should do. And I'll give you another real example. Think about when you see a, a pregnant mother, an expecting mother out in a grocery store. People come up to her and she's glowing, they're glowing. That's the beginning of life. The perinatal experience in a hospital is world-class. We still send cookies back to the nurses who delivered my wife's three kids. That is an experience that we should have at the end of life. And we have all the tooling for it, but nobody seems to focus on it because we're afraid to talk about loss and we're afraid to manage the messiness of death. And that's what our system is set up to do. It literally brings all the service entities, all the families, all the patients to one place, and it manages to ensure we achieve the right clinical outcomes following the wishes of the patient family and the right financial outcomes, which the business of healthcare is set up to deliver. Well, let's go there for a moment because it's important to me. I think a lot of us leaders at times, and it's easy to do. I mean, this is a very complex industry. It's a difficult industry to innovate in, a lot happening, right? And sometimes we need to be reminded of why we do this. Mm-hmm. It's even that N of one, right? Yep. What do I mean by that, Jeremy? My question is the following. What's been some of the feedback that you and the team have received from the patients and the families that you do serve? That this is the holy grail, that some of what we've been dealing with are manila folders of and stacks of records that are as big as the old yellow pages in major metropolitan areas. So, and there's not a clinical person in our family, but we've had to figure out how to navigate all of this. We've turned off parts of the health system because I can't go to primary care because I'm already going to a pulmonologist, a neurologist, a cardiologist, and an oncologist. Well, the only person who cares about you as a person who's had the relationship for 15 years is the primary care, and you've turned him off because you had to decide which five visits were going to get your attention for the week. And so this world that we've created actually turns that on its head. It gives you a place to actually see as the oasis amongst all of the noise, and it allows you to ask very clear questions. 
I know what I want for the rest of my life. I want to walk my daughter down the aisle. And then this team says, great, if that's the cornerstone event that we're going to manage around, then we're going to get you there and you're going to be out of your wheelchair and we're going to ensure that that day is a good one for you and your family. That's very different than saying you're a stage four pancreatic metastatic cancer case. You've got six months to live and we're going to do chemotherapy. That's not about the person. That's about the therapeutics. And if there's no good outcome, why do we keep applying that therapeutic? Like that's the question that we sort of pose is let's flip everything on its head and look at the person as a person, not as a patient with a set of diagnoses. Well, there's going to be some community members that tune into the podcast. I know what they're asking right now. Jeremy, how does this work? What are the business levers? What are the revenue models? How does this work as a business, Acclivity Health? What does that look like as some of our community members, our healthcare administrators, payers, providers are all on sides of the aisle? I'm sure they're going to want to know how does it actually work there? Yeah. So the currency in healthcare today is data against the per member per month. Whether you're a provider at risk or a health plan, you understand that methodology. The problem is that methodology doesn't work for hospice and palliative organizations because they think of patients as a daily census and a daily rate of pay. So we are the conduit in between all of those differences. I can understand the revenue model on the hospice and palliative side. I can understand the revenue model on a plan or a provider at risk organization. And then we can provide the conduits to serve them differently because a plan need is very different than a hospice provider need, but they actually meet at the intersection of this patient. And the thing we solve, honestly, is by making the cost low enough for us to actually charge for a set of services for all the constituents being served, but make it below what the market would typically charge for a set of services that are as robust as ours are. And so everybody jumps on. And it's literally like the freemium version of an app, but it's in healthcare and it's doing a very specific approach to care. I liken it to think about when you have a mass on your body and the clinician will send pathology off, report, you know, a diagnostic request of pathology. It comes back as malignant or benign. We're doing that now about things that healthcare's never gotten right. Humans estimate prognosis accurately at about a 12% precision. We're at 90%. So imagine if you could answer the question that clinicians hate the most. How much time do I have left, doc? That's the least favored question of them all because there's not experience that dictates they're going to get it right at about 12% of the time. Now put in their hands something that is clearly as black and white as benign or malignant. And now you can start to have a very different shape of healthcare at that last corridor of life and the two years leading up to it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Jeremy. It's powerful. Let's also think future state a bit, Jeremy. I want to know, again, you've been at it. You've had multiple exits. You usually see where that puck is heading. Where are things heading in this space? Like you mentioned, 10,000 people a day retiring, the silver tsunami. We all know it's coming. This is big. Mm-hmm. What does this mean? What does this mean for Oclivity Health Solutions? What does this mean for this industry? What does this mean for our nation? And I'm not even talking 10 years from now. I'm even talking the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months. What's future state look like for the industry, for our nation, and where you guys see things heading over at Oclivity Health? Yeah, if you sort of step back, you can see what was playing out even back in the Affordable Care Act of Obamacare era. We were looking then at a 2026 Medicare Part A funding issue, right? We're going to run into the red. Under the Trump administration, that's moved forward a little bit even before COVID, just because our spend is outpacing what we predicted. You throw COVID into the mix. And so now we're literally at the inflection point where we've aged too many people into the benefit and we don't have enough of revenue to cover it. So you don't have to read tea leaves to see that what's about to happen is a full seismic shift in healthcare. And what we think is going to be the most impactful are things like legislation you're seeing under the CARES Act, which make data become readily available under the FHIR FHIR standards. We're seeing innovations out of CMMI. 70 of them have been pushed forward so far, almost all of them taking targeting the triple aim where it's about higher quality, lower cost, satisfaction, et cetera. Those things continue to scale. It's a ever a widening and improving opportunity for us as a business to take all the data that's now being made fluid and available and continue to showcase, hey, we're seeing good clinical outcomes here. We're seeing really great financial outcomes. We're going to save the system from itself where these big misses are happening economically. And if we do it well, the gallon of gas and the gallon of milk don't go to $10 and $15, right? Which will happen because if we can't afford healthcare, if we can't care for our own citizens, the rest of the sort of economic picture starts to fall apart. Well, yeah, thank you for that just have to call it what it is, right? I mean, it's called a spade a spade and that's where we're at and that's where we're heading. But we do have a moment in time to really take advantage of the opportunity and put us on the right track. And with leaders like you, 
I'm hopeful, I remain hopeful that we'll be able to get there, but we do have a lot of work in front of us. But let's also think about how we can be helping you, Jeremy, helping you and the Acclivity Health team. It is amazing the leaders that have rallied around this podcast across the nation, some of our industry's finest. What's one problem, need, or question that you and the team have that our community can be helping you with? Yeah, I mean, I think about the emerging provider and payer model that's been taking shape, right? Kaiser kind of started it. UPMC, Mayo, others are following in line. And if I was going to ask a simple, succinct question, it really is, if that's your goal in life is to take on risk of a population as a provider or as a payer, become a provider services organization, that's what we built our business to do. We manage certainly the end of life space really well, but we do everything from womb to tomb. And it would be to find those organizations who Though they may have analytics, it's always only looked at utilization and cost. It's never looked at the whole person. It didn't take into their thinking social determinants or or the geography of a population. It doesn't understand that these persons have wishes beyond just their diagnoses. And that's the work we've been doing for four years that I think is game changing for those organizations that are these instrumental ones that are going to make all the change. The challenger plans, the health plans that are challengers like Oscar and others, Those are the ones, the provider services organizations like Oak Street and Village MD, those are the ones, the Centines of the world, the well, I mean, you can put a list, Humana with their kindred relationship, you can put all of those folks on the table and that's going to be the soup that becomes the really big players in the future. And we think we're onto something that would make those guys really turn that tide, the sort of the bad news I just talked about into really good news. It means all of us pay less for healthcare, but the quality is better. It means all of us have access to the right doctors at the right time, but that's not invisible. It means that pricing transparency comes online. All those things that we're all working on really start with who are the organizations that are going to be provider and payer as a hybrid, and how do we get you guys thinking around this particular topic the way that we've started to see really big results? Well, I'm sure some ears perked up while listening to this episode and what you just outlined there, Jeremy. But of course, we're going to need to be able to figure out where to get a hold of you online. Where are some social media contact points? websites or otherwise, how can we find you online? Yeah. So certainly go first to our website, Acclivity Health, A-C-C-L-I-V-I-T-Y health.com. You can find all of our contacts there. If you want a direct line to me, info at acclivityhealth.com gets directly to me. That's a simple way to find me. And then we're on all the social media channels as Acclivity Health as well. Excellent. All those contact points for our listeners are down in the episode notes. Just simply scroll down in your favorite podcast player, click on through to get a hold of Jeremy and the team over Acclivity Health. Of course, you can always head over to our free global online community at passionatepioneers.com. There will be a post for Jeremy's episode where you can also leave some feedback, comments, and ideas for Jeremy and the team, again, over at passionatepioneers.com. Well, Jeremy, thank you for that. I appreciate everything that you shared. I do have one more segment for you. It's a fill in the blank. I'm a passionate pioneer because... I'm going to make an impact on all of healthcare. I love it. Well, Jeremy, thank you for getting together today and sharing your journey. It was important, especially for our aspiring entrepreneurs that tune in to hear from somebody that has been there and done that to recognize the opportunity at hand that we can, in fact, reimagine healthcare if we just keep at it one day at a time. And you're doing exactly that, Jeremy. So thank you so much for taking a pit stop on our podcast and sharing everything that's happening over at the Clivity Health Camp. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Mike. It was great. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode. 